Hi everyone, I'm going to give everyone a minute to log in from the waiting room and that will give me a chance to start up closed captioning. So I'll do that right now. When the closed captioning is working, you'll see a red live box at the top left of your screen and you can click on that to see the closed captions in a separate window. And I'll also post that link in the chat box just in case you can't directly get to it by clicking on the red box. Okay. Welcome everybody. My name is Christy Baglow. I'm the Director of Statewide Training at Florida Legal Services. I'm glad you can join us today for a webinar about guardians ad litem in the domestic relations and dependency courts. I am so happy to have back with us Tanisia Hall, who was just here last week doing a family law legislative update for us. So if you missed that, it's on the YouTube page, which I'll also post in the chat box. Uh, Tanisia is the litigation director at the Legal Aid Society of the Orange County Bar Association. So thank you for coming back, Tanisia. And her coworker, Caravius Cowart, is also here with us. He's the Guardian Ad Litem Program Litigation Director, also at the Legal Aid Society of the Orange County Bar Association. So thank you both so much for doing this webinar. I do just want to let everyone know that Tanisia and Caravius have graciously condensed this webinar, which was a very long training, into one hour. So we will not have time for Q&A during this webinar but they will get try to get you out of here in an hour and cover all the good stuff that they have to cover. I did apply for CLE credit, but the Florida Bar is a little bit behind with the pandemic and people like me clogging the system with CLE applications. So as soon as I get that, I will pass it along to everybody. Uh, welcome again, Tanisia and Caravius, and I will pass it over to Caravius. All right, let me uh, just get my screen up so you guys can see. All right, so I'm, I'm going to talk about guardians that light them in dependency proceedings um, and just a few of the things that we will cover here today. Um, how do dependency cases begin? Uh, GAL appointment, representation models, access to records, and the role of the guardian at litem. And then finally, I'll touch on appointment in delinquency proceedings uh, because a lot of the circuits now have what we call crossover courts and, and we'll get more into that uh, later in the presentation. All right, so how do these cases start? Um, the, these dependency cases start with uh, what's called an, an abuse report being called in, um, either called into the anonymous hotline or uh, completed online here at uh, DCF's uh, website to report abuse. Um, and usually uh, these are often reported by teachers and school administrators and doctors and neighbors um, or any, any person really with knowledge of what's going on, um, the type of abuse or neglect or abandonment that might be occurring. Um, so if you have knowledge um, of these things, you can also report. Um, it, it's not a restriction on who can report, um, and, and in fact, they encourage uh, more uh, people to report these, um, these allegations. <clears throat> All right, so once in a, a report is called in, um, a child protective investigator uh, has to go out and complete an investigation of, of the situation. Um, GAL is not appointed yet. We're not even to the point uh, where there's a court case yet. Sorry. Okay. Uh, we're not even to the point where there's a, there's a court case yet. So uh, once the investigator goes out and determines whether or not the child is in, is in uh, immediate danger, uh, they will make the decision whether or not to, to remove the child. Um, if they decide to remove the child, um, the child is then placed into an emergency placement um, that can be with a, a relative, another parent, um, or even into a temporary foster home um, <clears throat> until uh, a shelter hearing occurs. Um, and shelter hearings must occur within 24 hours of the removal of the child. 
<clears throat> and so at the shelter hearing, the judge then determines whether or not there was probable cause to remove the child. Um, and then, and if they determined it was probable cause, then we have what we have now is a dependency case. <clears throat> So for GAL appointment and the statutory requirements, um, the GAL can be appointed at the shelter hearing or any time after. Um, the GAL is also a party to the dependency case. Um, I know there may be some conf confusion about that because we represent the best interest of the child, but we are party to the case. Um, and you can find that information in the definition for the, the guardian ad litem um, in Florida statutes 39.820. Uh, and some of the duties that we as GALs have include home or school visits. Um, and right now during the pandemic, a lot of phone and Zoom visits, uh, communicating with children, caregivers, case managers, teachers, and therapists. We attend hearings, we attend staffings. Um, these are just case related meetings that are called staffings and we file reports and or pleadings in cases. <clears throat> GALs are, are appointed to represent the best interests of the child during the proceedings. Um, and we also report the child's wishes to the court. Um, in, depending on the situation and the you know what's going on with the case we we can ask for an attorney at litem uh, to be appointed to the child to represent the child's uh, direct wishes um, chapter 39 has a few situations where they call for uh, the automatic appointment of a of an attorney at litem uh, for instance if a child um, is is being considered for placement into a residential treatment center, an attorney at litem uh, must be appointed to represent that child's direct wishes. Um, obviously, when we're talking about uh, residential treatment, that's, that's a, a loss of liberty. And so we can see the importance of having uh, someone to represent the child's direct wishes in that, uh, in that situation. Um, <clears throat> guardian at litems, we must be appointed in termination of parental rights proceedings. Um, a lot of times due to resources and, and everything when there are uh, when there are cases and the child remains with a parent. Um, oftentimes we, we may not ask to be appointed or we may ask to be discharged from those cases where a child is with a parent. Um, just be, you know, just to kind of save our resources for uh, cases where children are actually removed and in foster care um, and then for these termination of parental rights pr proceedings. Um, another thing to know is that the GAL is immune from civil or criminal liability um, as they have a prima, prima facie presumption to be acting in good faith um, in these cases. Um, and you can find more information about that in 39.822. All right. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the different representation models that we have. I know a lot of people on this call are, from, are not from Orange County. Um, and so we have a statewide model and then we have an Orange County model. Um, under the statewide model, uh, they statewide GAL program uses lay volunteers to serve as GALs. Um, and then they also have best interest attorneys um, that are in the courtroom actually handling the litigation piece uh, for it. Um, Orange County guardian ad litems are all licensed attorneys. Um, and, and the reason for that is that they, they felt that it would be better for the children to have um, an attorney uh, representing them. Um, and the Orange County model has actually been around um, prior to statewide GAL's existence. And so we were allowed to uh, keep that model um, and just contract with statewide instead of becoming a part of the statewide GAL program. And then we have staff attorneys. Um, currently, right now, we have uh, 10 staff attorneys um, in the GAL program. Um, and then we also have pro bono attorneys that we uh, get to take uh, pro bono cases from, from us. So at any given time, we probably have anywhere between 250 to 300 uh, pro bono attorneys in our community that are taking uh, GAL uh, cases. So we, we, we definitely get a lot of a lot of support from uh, the, the pro bono um, attorneys here uh, locally. 
Um, and then one thing that I did leave off of here that is that we do use lay volunteers, even though our even though our GALs have to be licensed attorneys, uh, we do use and do have a need for lay volunteers. Uh, we call them uh, volunteer advocates for children, um, and we use these volunteers. Uh, to help us complete home visits with children um, and attend um, some of the out of court uh, meetings. Um, again, a lot of our pro bono attorneys um, don't primarily practice dependency law. Um, and so having that assistance from a lay volunteer really helps them out in the case um, to where they can really focus in on the legal aspect of the case while you have uh, a lay person conducting visits and, and, and taking care of other things for you. <clears throat> so access to records, um, GALs have, we have the right to inspect and copy uh, records. Um, we are information gatherers and these records play a huge part in our role to the court. Um, <clears throat> as you all know, uh, we have to provide a report and a recommendation to the court about several things from uh, the child's placement to uh, the child's permanency go to uh, where, you know, the child's school and, and, and all these, you know, other, other things. And so we have to uh, have access to these records um, and these individuals with these records in order to uh, properly do our job. Uh, so um, in the school aspect, we're talking about IEP records um, or attendance records. Um, you know, we get a lot of, we get a lot of cases where uh, cases come in and, and we find out that the child hasn't been attending school regularly um, and that becomes an issue. And so we, we need to look at those records and, you know, so we can help address uh, that situation. Uh, report cards is another thing that we, we like to, we like to get a copy of and get a hold of. Um, if you have kids that are underperforming, um, you know, we, we, we need to investigate, you know, why they're underperforming isn't an issue where the, the youth may need an IEP um, or is it something else that's going on? Because if they need an IEP, um, then, you know, we need to follow up on that and ensure that an IEP um, is getting is, is in place. Um, obviously, uh, medical records is another type of record that that we need and, and often uh, get copies of and to review and, and, and inspect uh, several kids come in the system and have special medical needs um, that need to be addressed, um, that may not have been being addressed properly prior to the, to the initi of, initiation of the case. And so we, we need those records uh, to, to ensure that those needs are being met. Um, and then other records, uh, for instance, the, the CBHA, uh, which is the Comprehensive Behavioral Health Assessment, um, the majority of our youth get these assessments done upon, sorry about that, um, upon entering uh, the, the system, entering foster care. And this is a very comprehensive assessment that provides us with the child's uh, family history, the child's medical behavioral history, the, the parent's medical behavioral history, if it's available, um, and, and different uh, other family uh, history. Um, and it really helps uh, guide us as far as what are the needs of the child. Um, it can give us a diagnosis. If the child has a mental health diagnosis, a CBHA can give us that. Uh, so it's, it's really a great start uh, for us when we when these cases come in and a, and a real guide to the services that a child may or may not need. All right, the role of the guardian ad litem in the courtroom. Um, as I stated earlier in the presentation, the GAL is a party to the case, um, which means that we file pleadings um, and we can call witnesses uh, to testify. Uh, this is a fiduciary representation um, the GAL is present at all critical stages of the proceedings. Um, so that's the, after the shelter, because we're appointed usually at shelter, um, that's the arraignment, the, ju the judicial review, uh, dependency trial, a termination of parental rights trial, um, all the way through an adoption or reunification, you know, depending on the, the goal of the case. Um, and then we provide reports and recommendations to the court 
um, and, and those reports are judicial review reports, uh, manifest best interest reports when we're talking about termination of, of parental rights, and then just uh, general status reports. Um, one thing I do want to point out about Orange County is that we have been excused from providing written judicial review reports um, and are allowed to provide our reports orally um, in the court at the judicial review. Um, however, if, if a GAL is unable to attend a judicial review, uh, they definitely can feel free to uh, provide a written report. Um, here in Orange County, uh, we have one of our staff attorneys sitting in on every hearing, um, unless the case is a conflict. Um, but outside of that, we have a, an attorney sitting on every single um, hearing that we're appointed to. Um, so if there is a pro bono and a pro bono can't attend the hearing, um, oftentimes we can just cover the hearing for them um, or, or again, they can file a report. Um, and the reports must be filed at least 72 hours before the hearing. Um, and that's referring to the judicial review reports and the MBI reports. Status reports can be filed anytime. The role of the GAO outside of the courtroom. Um, out, out of court meetings, uh, we have a lot of case related staffings that we attend. And these meetings uh, can vary in, in topic of discussion. Uh, we have, for instance, we have a family service team meeting, which, which is a staffing that uh, where we get together and, and discuss uh, the parents' progress in the case, the, the child's needs and services, and you know whether or not we need to, to change the permanency goal of the case. Um, we have staffings that are specific to children, um, such as the youth transition meetings, uh, which are our older youth, uh, 16 and older, who we anticipate uh, that may be uh, aging out of the foster care system at age 18. Um, and, the, and the purpose of those meetings is just to get together and discuss and figure out if the youth has everything they need um, to be an adult when they turn 18, such as a, a state ID, um, a copy of their birth certificate and social security card, uh, making sure they have a bank account um, <clears throat> and, taken, and have taken a financial literacy course so, so they can understand about managing their money and their funds. Um, other types of meetings that we attend, um, as I mentioned earlier, we, during the record section, we, we get school records. Uh, we, we attend school meetings, so IEP meetings, uh, meetings regarding school changes, uh, and meetings with teachers and counselors. Um, and, and one thing that, that you want to note about the school meetings, um, your different districts are represented. They do have um, attorneys on staff. So here in Orange County, we actually have a relationship with the Orange County uh, public school system. Um, but, you know, as an attorney, you definitely want to keep that in mind and, and reach out uh, to the school's counsel uh, prior to just contacting um, a teacher or anything like that because they are represented and so you can run into issues like that if you if you haven't uh, reached out to the the school board um, as an attorney not the school board but the school's attorney as an attorney um, and then lastly we attend some medical appointments um, this is this is something that we probably don't do as often um, is attending medical appointments. This is usually left to like the case manager and usually the caregiver. Uh, but there are instances where um, I myself have attended medical appointments with youth. Um, I actually had a youth that was having dental surgery and, and wanted me to take him to the surgery. Um, and so I obliged. Uh, but you can, you can speak with the physician. Um, they, you know, a lot of, a lot of youth are prescribed psychotropic medications. Um, and so I know I went to, um, an appointment with the, the child and the psychiatrist prior in the past, um, where we kind of just discussed the, the child's medication. And, you know, I was just there to make sure, uh, that the child was being heard about the different medications and how they were making the child feel. Um, and so it was, it was really, I think, beneficial. And so these things can be definitely beneficial um, as the GAL with um, making sure you're advocating for the best interest of the child. All right. Um, all right, and then lastly, 
I'll touch on guardian ad litems in delinquency proceedings. So here we, we have what's called crossover youth. And again, a lot of circuits have the crossover uh, courts and the crossover dockets, um, but crossover youth are those youth who, who, we refer to those youth who are involved in dependency and delinquency proceedings. So they've been removed uh, from their parents or there's an open dependency case due to abandonment, abuse or neglect. Um, and then also they have a delinquency case. Um, and so we call those crossover. Um, and so here in Orange County and in other circuits, we, we have what's called a crossover docket where one judge hears both the dependency case and the child's uh, delinquency cases. Um, the GAL in the dependency case can be appointed in the delinquency case. Um, prior to us having the crossover docket, um, this was uh, often a, a matter of practice for us to get to try and get appointed in the delinquency case um, if we had a youth involved in dependency. Um, the importance of this is that the GAL can provide cr critical information to the state attorney and the public defender, as well as the court, um, such as what services are being provided to the youth um, in the dependency case um, and what's going on with the youth. Um, <clears throat> and again, it's best interest ad advocacy. Um, the child, as I stated, has a, has, usually has a public defender um, unless they have a private attorney, they have a public defender, um, and that's the person who is there to provide uh, the, the, the direct representation of the child where we are there for best interest advocacy. And we can provide recommendations to the court on the outcome of the case, um, such as should the youth be sent to a, a commitment program, um, or should they, be, uh, should they be referred to a diversion program? Are there other alternatives or there other factors to consider um, I'll tell you a quick story uh, before I end. I remember being in a training one time in a presenter. Um, it was a crossover docket training, a crossover court training. Um, and the pre presenter talked about a youth who had gotten a delinquency charge um, from hitting a bus, a school bus driver. And, you know, the, the thing about it though, the dependency case was there because the child had been abused and so the bus driver had went back to the child's seat to make the child move. And the way the bus driver grabbed the child was the same exact way the child was being abused um, that led to the dependency case. So it was a trigger for the child when the child was grabbed a certain way, it triggered the child. Um, and in that, in that particular case, the GAL was able to provide that information to the delinquency court um, and it helped the child's case because this wasn't just a youth that was upset and wanted to fight or hit the school's bus driver. This was a youth who had been abused and, um, you know, the way they were grabbed was a trigger for them. Um, and so that, that's a good example. I always like to provide that example of how and why GALs are important um, in these crossover cases. All right, and that is it for me. So, wonderful. Thank you for all that information. I can really tell by your story how much of a difference it can make uh, in the outcome. That's that's fantastic. Now, if people are interested in volunteering for your GAL program, how can they do that? Can you put that in the chat for everyone? Uh, yes, I will put my email address in the chat as well as um, our other volu our volunteer advocate for children coordinator email address for uh, for lay volunteers. So I'll, I'll put that in the chat while uh, Tanisi is presenting. Perfect. Thank you so much. And I will hand it over to Tanisia now. Hi, everybody. My name is Tanisia Hall. I'm the family law uh, attorney at the Legal Aid Society of the Orange County Bar Association here in Orlando. And today I'm gonna to be presenting on guardian ad items in domestic relations court. So let me start sharing my screen. All right. So during our side of the presentation, we're gonna talk about the different stages of a case, hearsay and special considerations. 
There are different types of domestic relations cases. There are adoptions, dissolutions of marriage, which were formerly called divorces, injunctions for protection, including those against domestic violence, paternities, modifications, and temporary or concurrent custody of minors by relatives. These are all types of cases in which guardian ad litems could be appointed. What you also notice is depending on how many different areas of law you practice or you touch, guardians ad litem can be appointed in any area of law. We recently had someone appointed in probate court um, to deal with you know, the, the settlements for the minor. Uh, guardian ad litems have been appointed in real estate court in all different areas. So for those of you who did not know, beyond dependency and domestic relations, there are other opportunities for individuals to serve um, as the voice of the child or the best interest of the child. The parties in most domestic relations cases are uh, generally going to be the parents, um, parent one and parent two. In some cases, there can be more than one parent or more than two parents or more than two petitioners or more than two respondents. And so it's always best to know when you're first asked to serve as the guardian in a case, who the actual parties are. I always, you know, refer to it as a cast of characters. Who are all the characters in this event? And how are they related to the child? And what allegations have brought forth, been brought forth to the court or to the parents to request your assistance in helping the court to determine what's in that child's best interest? Now, once the guardian ad litem is appointed to the case, the guardian ad litem also becomes a party to the case. You do not need to have an attorney represent you when you become a guardian ad litem in a domestic relations case. You can still file your own documents. Now, the minor in a domestic relations case, unlike a dependency case, is normally not a party to the case. Furthermore, minors are not allowed to come to court or to testify unless there's a unified family court or a prior order permitting their attendance and testimony. Now, if you have a minor who has been emancipated, that minor may be a party to the case. When you go into the courtroom, there could be a whole host of individuals present. And now on Zoom, there could be a lot of different boxes open. You have the judge, the trial clerk, the court deputies, petitioners, if there are counsels for the petitioners, the respondent, counsels for the respondent, guardian ad litems, or occasionally there may be an issue where you do have to secure your own counsel. And if you do, your counsel will be present as well as witnesses. Um, if there's an attorney ad litem present, because a child can have two, the child can have a guardian ad litem advocating for their best interests and an attorney at litem advocating for their wishes and desires. Whoever is related to the case would be present for your hearing. Now, like I said before, you're not allowed to have the minor child into the courtroom. Pursuant to the Florida Family Law Rule of Procedure 12.407, you have to file a motion to permit minor child testimony prior to having that child um, come into court. Additionally, one of the issues we're seeing now with COVID-19 is we have a lot of parents who are at home and their children are at home in school and the parents are in the same room. And so the parent is on one computer or one device having a hearing and the child is either sitting next to them or across from the room and can hear things that are going on. And in those situations, sometimes we ask the, the parent to go sit in the car. Um, if it's safe to leave the child in the house, to go sit in the car for the purposes of the hearing, or to go to a, a, a quiet room with a closed door for the purposes of the hearing. Because again, the children still should not be involved and should not be hearing the things that are being discussed. Some judges have taken to the um, notion of not allowing any virtual backgrounds on their hearings and having you swivel your device around the room so that they can see if anyone else is in the room. Now, when you are appointed as a guardian ad litem, you are appointed to make a recommendation regarding the best interest of the child. And that recommendation is gonna be one of the items the court will re rely on um, for determining what's best. The child's preference is one of the factors in 6113 that the court will take into consideration. 
So the child cannot speak directly to the court without going through a number of different steps, but the child can speak to you and relay their wishes and desires. And you can take into account um, how to act upon that and how to relay those desires. This is the actual language of the rule that prohibits the minor children from testifying or from coming into court. So I will just leave it there for you for a second. Oh, let me go back so that you can review it. I'm gonna have to grab my charger in just a second. That would be another pointer for court, um, especially now that we're doing all of these virtual hearings, make sure your devices are fully charged. We had a client, once she attended her hearing on a bicycle, so that was a big no-no, but her phone actually died halfway through her trial, and so she was unable to participate in the second half of the trial. The case continued without her. Thankfully, there was a favorable outcome. So this is a prohibition against having minor children testify or be present in court. It also talks about related proceedings. You heard Caravius talk about unified family court previously. If the rules of juvenile procedure or some other rule allows the child's um, second case or companion case to be heard concurrently with your case, then obviously the child would be present in the hearing for that. Also with uncontested adoptions, children are allowed to attend uncontested adoption hearings. Now, there is a pro se motion and order for testimony and attendance of a minor child at court that you can find at the Florida Supreme Court website, flcourts.org, under family law forms. There is a draft order. And then the link to the forms is here in the PowerPoint, which will be shared with you um, tomorrow when Christy sends out an email to all of the attendees. There are different stages in domestic relations court. You heard Caravius talk about uh, dependency court stages, shelter hearings, judicial reviews, TPR advisories. In family court, um, we have pleading stages, we have discovery phases, we have mediations, and we have trials. So with our different steps, we have petitions, we have answers or counter petitions. There's a parenting class requirement for any case in Florida that has children involved, they have to attend a parenting class within 45 days, not the same class. It has, doesn't have to be uh, in person or online. They have that option and it's four hours long. It's not like the intensive 24 hour class that they may have to do in a dependency case. This is a four hour class that they can take over the course of four, four weeks if they want to at their own leisure until they get their certificate of completion. There's a mandatory financial disclosure requirement under rule 12.285, where there has to be a, a certain exchange of financial affidavits and financial documentation to help with uh, support issues or property issues. Discovery is our investigation phase. The parties would have to go to a mediation, which is a settlement conference, which are neutral third party. If there is a guardian ad litem involved in a case at the time of mediation, the guardian ad litem would be expected to participate in that mediation as well as in the discovery process. Um, and as well as any hearings, trials, or final hearings, the guardian ad litem would be um, expected to participate and to file recommendations. Now, a guardian ad litem is appointed when there are allegations of abuse, abandonment, or neglect. Um, a guardian litem can be appointed to determine whether or not relocation is in the child's best interest, whether or not the child's, you know, gender should be changed. You can be appointed on very specific issues, or you can be appointed to rec make a recommendation in the totality as to what's in the child's best interest. So always review the proposed order of appointment, and if you have it, the motion for appointment for guardian ad litem to see what exactly you're being tasked with. Have a retainer meeting with your um, parties. Even if you're not you know, getting paid, if you're doing it on a pro bono basis or through your local legal aid legal services, you should still have the parties sign a retainer agreement. I'm not saying that they should be paying any costs, but there should still be a document to let them know who you are, what you do, and to clarify with them that you are not their attorney, you are not representing them, you are not the child's attorney, and you're not representing the child. You are there to investigate 
the issue that you have been appointed to investigate and to speak on the best interest of the child. Once you're appointed, you're gonna do an acceptance of appointment, notify all the parties that you're involved, and then you're gonna start combing through the court file to see you know, the, the procedural history of the case. You're gonna set up meetings with the parents and meetings with the child, maybe teachers and doctors, depending on the issues, so that you can have a clear view of what's going on because you don't want to start your appointment as a guardian ad litem with any type of bias. Now, Florida Statute 61.401 deals with the appointment of a guardian ad litem, and it states that an action for dissolution of marriage or a creation, approval, or modification of a parenting plan. If the court finds it's in the best interest of the child, the court may appoint a guardian ad litem to act as the next friend of the child, investigator, or evaluator, but not as an attorney or an advocate. So remember before I mentioned there's a difference between a guardian ad litem and an attorney ad litem. The attorney ad litem would be an attorney or advocate for the child. Now, next we're gonna talk about 6113 2B, which states what the parenting plan must have. At a minimum, it must include an adequate detail of how the parents will share and be responsible for daily tasks associated with the upbringing of the child. So when you're making your recommendation and investigation, you want to look into who's doing what and who's done what historically and how they're going to do it now that they're no longer together. The fact that one parent always worked while the other parent was at home used to be a negative, but now as the courts have um, evolved, everyone now realizes there are different ways that people care for their children. And you're just there to make a recommendation as to whether or not they're going to make the best choices for those children. You're also going to make a recommendation to the court to let them know how much they're actually going to rely on third parties. Um, in your parenting plan recommendation too, you have to include, you know, time sharing schedule arrangements that specify the time that the minor child will spend with each parent. I always remind people we no longer use the phrases custody and visitation when we talk about parents in the state of Florida. Everything is a parenting plan that includes parental responsibility and um, time sharing. With regard to parental responsibility, your parenting plan must also designate who will be responsible for all forms of health care. If the court orders share parental responsibility over health care decisions, the parenting plan must provide that either parent may consent to mental health treatment for the child. That is very important. If you're using the forms on the Florida Supreme Court website, then that language is in there. But if you draft your own forms or you're working on forms that are you know, three, four or five years old, you wanna make sure that this is listed in there because it is now statutorily required that if there's shared parental responsibility, the parenting plan must provide that either parent may consent to mental health treatment. The parenting plan will also designate this for school related matters, who's gonna be able to register that child in school, what address is gonna be used for registration purposes and any other specific activities that need to have a designate. Remember, you can make recommendations as to share parental responsibility, share parental responsibility with ultimate decision-making authority on certain issues or on global issues, or sole parental responsibility. The parenting plan must also describe in adequate detail the methods and technologies that the parents will use to communicate with the child. Now there are different types of parenting plans. As a guardian ad litem, I mean, you will be familiar with the ones that are on Florida Supreme Court website where you have the, I would say, traditional parenting plan form. You also have a supervised or safety focused parenting plan form. And then you also have a form for relocation or long distance. And for the state of Florida, that is considered to be 50 miles or more between the two parents' homes. Now. In some circuits, they have reduced that number. I know some courts in South Florida have a 45 mile limit. So be sure to check with your local circuits administrative orders to see if they have restricted any of the relocation um, distances or any other provisions that you, you may be tasked with investigating. 
Now, the parenting plan can be a mediated parenting plan, which would be the result of you know, a mediation or a settlement conference. It can be a settlement agreement or it can be court ordered. But your recommendation as the guardian ad litem will be taken into account before the court approves it. Because even if it's a mediated parenting plan or a settlement agreement, the court still has the ultimate duty to determine whether or not what was agreed upon was in the best interest of the child. So this is just more information on the different types of court hearings you may come across as a guardian ad litem. And your attendance may be waived at some of these events. So whenever the parties are coordinating hearings, be sure to find out exactly what's being noticed, what will be discussed, and whether or not you truly need to be involved in that hearing. Um, and then if for some reason they have a hearing and discuss issues that weren't properly noticed, there are certain um, ramifications that would be in place and there are certain things you can do to have those overruled or vacated should they not be in the child's best interest. So we talked briefly about mediations, which was a settlement conference. And then depositions are Q&A sessions on the record in front of a court reporter. Now we're doing them all through Cisco or you know, Zoom, but generally it's when the, the parties go, they sit down with the opposing counsel and an opposing counsel can pretty much ask any question remotely related to the case. Um, there are exceptions, obviously. The rules of evidence still apply. You can still object. You're not allowed to do speaking objections, but you can still object to the deposition to preserve your objection for the record should the transcript come in later. And there are a few things that you can direct your client not to answer, such as privileged testimony. But um, I don't know that we have a training on depositions on YouTube yet. I know that uh, there are some trainings for uh, legal services attorneys through MBI. They've done deposition trainings, I think, every year. So check with your local office to see if there are any other trainings for you to go out to get trial skills, should you wish to. We also have hearings such as ex parte hearings. Those are hearings that are one-sided, either they're emergency relief or it's an uncontested matter. We have short motion hearings, which don't require any evidence or any testimony. It's mostly attorneys arguing over mandatory disclosure or compliance or things of that nature or getting direction from the court. There are temporary relief hearings, emergency hearings, um, evidentiary motion hearings, which are like many trials, um, and then final hearings or trials. A guardian ad litem participates in the proceedings by reviewing the court file, any companion court files, speaking with the parties and collateral witnesses. So when you do your initial interview of the parents and the children, you're always gonna to wanna to ask them if they have anybody else that they would like for you to speak to. Um, and then consider whether or not you need to go speak to them. When you get the names of any witnesses, get their addresses, their phone numbers, and their emails, and then ask the person who's providing that witness information, what exactly that witness can testify to. Um, and then that will let you know whether or not you need to have an extensive uh, contact with them or just a collateral contact. If there are educational and medical issues, be sure to review the education and medical records. Um, make sure that you're participating in all settlement negotiations that deal with the children um, and that you're attending any hearing regarding the minor children, regardless of what, you know, the hearing is titled. Hearsay is a big one. Um, for us in domestic relations court, because unlike family court, hearsay, uh, well, unlike dependency court, hearsay is an extreme barrier to uh, guardian ad litems in family law court. So my uh, pointer for everybody is if you're going to serve as a guardian ad litem in a domestic relations court, have a hearsay waiver included in your order of appointment. Florida Statute 61.403 sub 5 states that the guardian ad litem may address the court and make written or oral recommendations to the court. The guardian ad litem shall file a written report, which may include recommendations and a statement of the wishes of the child. 
A statement, of course, is an oral or written assertion, nonverbal conduct, it's given by a declarant, and it's considered to be hearsay because it's going to be offered out of court to prove the truth of the matter asserted. So Florida Statute 90.801 is the hearsay definition. The dilemma is guardian ad litem reports and testimony are significantly based on hearsay. Hearsay from the child, hearsay from collateral sources, document reviews, and neither Florida Statute 61403 nor the Florida Evidence Code waive the hearsay exception for a guardian ad litem. Scarange versus Herrick stated that when a guardian attempts to testify to hearsay statements and a valid hearsay objection is raised, that objection is, should be sustained. Thus, great portions of the guardian items report and testimony could be excluded based on valid hearsay objections. The solution to the problem, again, is to make sure to obtain a hearsay waiver in both the order of appointment and your retainer agreement. Determine whether to use a limited waiver or a blanket hearsay waiver. Here's an example of a limited waiver of appointment. It states the parties in their respective counsel agree to waive hearsay objections regarding the guardian ad litem's testimony and written reports only as it pertains to school personnel, including but limited to teachers, guidance counselors, and principals, the children's healthcare professionals, including but not limited to pediatricians and treating medical professionals, but specifically excluding the child's therapist. There's a whole host of litigation when it comes to whether or not you can have testimony admitted from a child's therapist. Whether each parent can waive that, whether the child needs an attorney ad litem appointed, that's a whole other issue for another day. Just know, if you come to a point to where your child that you are investigating the best interest of is currently in therapy, to speak to your local legal services agency regarding any um, obstacles you may face in getting that therapist recommendation into the record. Um, and then for the limited waiver, of course, you always wanna include the child's statements. Hearsay objections to all other individuals here could be preserved. A blanket waiver would be um, something like this. The parties to the action shall agree prior to hearing that there should be no hearsay objection to the content of the guardian ad litem's report, and in the event such an objection is to be raised, the objecting party shall subpoena the witness from whom they object to the hearsay evidence. Subject to Florida Family Law Rule of Procedure 12.407, that is the rule that prohibits the minor child testimony in attendance without going through a few steps. In this blanket waiver, it further says that the guardian ad litem shall list the names and addresses of the persons interviewed whose statements they have repeated or summarized in the report. If the addresses are not provided, the hearsay testimony is subject to hearsay objection. So that would be an example of a blanket waiver, but it would still get the, the gist of what you have done as a guardian ad litem to be admissible in your report and testimony. So for your retainer agreement, again, choose whether or not to use a limited waiver or a blanket waiver. Choose whether or not you're going to limit that waiver solely to information you get from the child or information you get from the child, the school personnel, the healthcare professionals, or the blanket waiver. The sample language for the retainer agreement is similar to the language we just read in the order. And again, this will come to you tomorrow in your um, emails. So this says you agree that you will not object to my report or my testimony being admissible in court because it contains hearsay as related to the child and statements by the child to me. You acknowledge that I have been asked to serve as a guardian ad litem for the purpose of investigating issues involving your child and that it is in your child's best interest to permit my report and testimony to be introduced into evidence despite the fact that it may contain hearsay. Now remember, even though you are waiving the hearsay objection uh, in this, you are not necessarily waiving the guardian ad litem's bias or any other impeachable um, information, or you're not waiving your disagreements with the report and recommendation. Special considerations. 
If your case involves domestic violence, substance abuse, mental health, or parental alienation, you want to make sure um, to talk to someone who's familiar with those dynamics to see how that can make a change in your recommendation. You could be dealing with a, a parent who has PTSD as a result of domestic violence. And from the outside looking in, that parent could be neglectful or depressed or it sleeps a lot. But if you're speaking to their mental health professional, you may notice that it's PTSD as a result of the abuse and you know, maybe family therapy can assist or um, some other types of interventions can be in the best interest of the child. Also on the line of therapy, I wanna let you know if there is domestic violence in a relationship, family therapy between the batterer and their abuser rarely is successful. And most times the abuser needs to have individual therapy first and the victim would need to necessarily have individual therapy first before even considering any joint therapy. Otherwise, family therapy can just be used as another way for the abuser to exert power and control over the victim. They learn more triggers and they can use those triggers against the victim should they reconcile. Or if they're gonna be co-parenting for the next 17 and a half years, um, they could use that information against them over and over again. With domestic violence, there is a power and control will that we all use. Um, the website is listed on the PowerPoint that you will receive. It's the Duluth model. There are a lot of different um, wheels on the website now. There's one for immigration. There's one for power and control. There's one for um, culture and uh, one for using the children. On all of these wheels, they have different slices um, and different examples of what domestic violence is. Domestic violence isn't always physical. There are different types and you will find examples of those types on the wheel. There's also a wheel there, um, post-separation power and control, which is uh, different forms of how a parent uses a child um, in the separation against a victim. There are examples such as disputing relationships with the children, um, always telling the children that the new paramour is bad or evil or ugly or you know, something of that nature, um, having fraudulent claims of uh, sex abuse or threatening to kill or kidnap the children, using harassment. There are a bunch of different things that you may hear, you know, here and there and think, oh, you know, this is serious or this is nothing. But when you take the totality of the statements that you're hearing, when you go back and read your notes and start forming a picture, the case may or may not have been identified as a case with domestic violence in the beginning. But as you do your investigation, you may notice more of these pieces fitting into certain wills. This will is also, of course, included in your PowerPoint. It includes you know, withholding financial support, which is another reason why, as a guardian item, you're not gonna make a recommendation as to child support, but it's another reason why I always like child support to go through the state, because that's just one other piece of power that you're taking away from a batterer. So I think I made my time um, regarding uh, guardian ad items in domestic relations cases. I did, and I just wanna, um, Go back and see if there's anything else. Let me check the chat real quick. Thank you so much, Denise. I put a link to the uh, model you were showing there, the Duluth model, so everyone can access that. And make sure you check out Tanisia's presentation from last week if you missed it. And there was also one yesterday about child welfare online resources that goes well with today's webinar. And in case I have not webinared you out this week, there's one tomorrow at noon. It's a Florida budget and policy roundup uh, specifically regarding things that legal aids may be interested in and that will be done by the Florida Policy Institute. So I will put that right here in the chat. So that's tomorrow at noon. Thank you so much, Denise and Cravius. That was fantastic. I don't know how you got it all into an hour, but it didn't even feel rushed. Lots of great information. Thank you. And for those of you who haven't seen it yet, there is, I believe, a four-hour um, CLE that we did on this very topic 
and we went into more detail, including breaking down how to make different recommendations on the factors. All of that is on um, our website, the Legal Aid Society of Orange County Bar Association. And I believe, Chrissy, you may have it on your YouTube page, or if not, it's definitely on the statewide Guardian at Items page. Okay, and I'll get that link from you and put it in the follow-up email. So everyone who registered today will get an email with uh, the recording. And I'll also put the PowerPoints in there. Uh, Tanisi and Cravius have agreed to share those with everybody. Uh, someone in the chat asked if there's a way to get a certificate of completion. Um, the Florida Bar just requires self-reporting, so I'm going to trust you all to be grown-ups that you watch this webinar all the way through. Um, oh, that's something that I can um, say, too. The difference is um, in the state of Florida, anybody can serve as a guardian at litem um, with the proper training. Uh, and if you are an attorney uh, through the Florida Bar and you wish to serve as a guardian ad litem, you do not need any other training in order to serve as a GAL. But if you are another professional and you want to serve as a guardian ad litem in domestic relations, you generally have to be trained by a um, approved source such as a legal services provider or things of that nature. So the person asking about the certificate of completion may be along those lines, because I know that's a, a misconception. Most attorneys don't know, or newer attorneys to guardian ad litem work, don't know that you, you can serve as a guardian ad litem just by being a Florida Bar member. We would love for you always to have training and to look at the trainings. We would love that. Um, but uh, with your bar card, you can serve as the guardian ad litem. I'm glad you clarified that and I'll definitely, uh, Cravius typed in the volunteer contact info and I'll also put that in the follow-up email so everyone has it. Yeah, and I just put the link, the Vimeo is the link to the four-hour uh, training. That's in it earlier Thank you. Today. <laughs> so if anyone has burning questions after today, you got your four hour training to get it all covered. <laughs> well, thank you both so much. And I encourage anyone who, who found this interesting and you know, you feel like you could do this, <laughs> please go ahead and reach out to Caravius and anyone else at Legal Aid Orange County Bar or your local legal aid. I'm sure they all could use help with these cases. There are a lot of kids out there who need your help. So I will put that information in the follow up email. Right, and then um, include my email too. I know I had a lot of people email me after last week. Um, really, I really don't mind the questions. You can keep them coming. You can call or email me and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. All right, thank you. That's very generous of you. I know you're a tad bit busy over there. So I really appreciate you doing both of these trainings for us and being willing to follow, field follow-up questions. So. Thank you both so much for doing this, and I hope everyone has a good rest of their afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.